before I get started, it was definitely a, uh, a great R story, and I curse a lot, and I hope to not to offend anybody. <laughs> so, you know, what kid grows up and dreams to be a dope fiend? I certainly did not. Um, I uh, started off a little rough in childhood. I moved around a lot. You know, I uh, lived with a single mother. I went to a lot of black schools, only white kid. So, you know, I got picked on a lot of fighting, and I had to watch my back growing up. You know, I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I was a typical kid, a little badass kid, man. They're just like getting in the trouble, getting in the shit. And, uh, you know, it changed when I moved in with my dad. You know, I, uh, he's a great father, probably one of the best fathers you could have. Uh, he was my coach uh, in every sport I played. You know, I was a typical, typical kid, like bike riding and, you know, throwing rocks and, you know, getting in fights and going to the mall and skating right with my friends. And so there's really no reason why I should have turned out the way I did. You know, um, it, I, uh, at the age of 13, you know, right before high school, you know, I'm thinking like, man, I can't go to high school early. You know, I gotta get laid. And like, there's all these like little things, the boxes I gotta check off before I go to high school. You know, that's what I thought. That was the group of friends I was hanging with. We are a bunch of knuckleheads. So I started smoking pot, started drinking. And, you know, at the time, this drug didn't have a negative impact on me. I didn't realize the, the severity of it. So I started smoking crack as well. You know, a 13-year-old kid had no idea. I thought it was just like smoking weed and drinking. So, you know, uh, I was able to hold on through high school. And, you know, I was still, I, I managed to have perfect attendance. I played sports. I, you know, was involved in activities and stuff. Uh, but my drug use on the weekends picked up in the summer. You know, like I said, I'm from New Jersey, so my parents used to go down the shore every weekend. They thought it was a good idea to leave three boys, three teenage boys, home alone all weekend. So needless to say, we took advantage of it. We, uh, you know, we had wild parties, uh, you know, four or five kegs lined up, DJs, live bands. I remember I brought a girl one time, and she's like, this is like something out of the movies. Like, I can't believe it. And it was like a typical party we used to have. You know, we'd steam back the carpets every Sunday before my parents came home so we could hide all the evidence. Move all the knickknacks upstairs, move them back down Sunday. You know, it was a well thought out plan. <laughs> so, you know, just, just we got a lot of kids puking in the closet. You know, one time we thought there was 12 of us. We thought it would be a good idea, guys and girls, to run butt naked about 12 blocks to the local pool. You know, on the way as cars are passing, we're mooning them as they drive by. You know, so we make it to the pool and we're just, we're jumping in, diving in, diving off the diving board. Just not, no care in the world. I'm not trying to be quiet, nothing. You know, so I'm looking over and I see this light bobbing up and down, like four or five lights in a row bobbing up and down. I'm like, what's that? As they get closer, I realize it's cops running down the hill and it's a flashlight bouncing up and down. And I'm like, shit. So everybody, of course, panics and they all jump out of the pool and da, 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 you know. So me and my cousin, the geniuses we are, we stay in the pool and we just have our lips above the water. And as the cops are walking around the pool, we're just slowly following them at the edge. They never call us. It was great. That must have been a real interesting police ride for the other nine or so people. You got like nine drunk, naked teenagers going to jail. You know, so the cops and everybody leave. Me and my cousin hop out, jog back 12 blocks back to my parents' place, butt naked, of course. You know, but for a typical kid, like a run-in with the cops, that would be the end of your night. You know, hey, maybe we should like, you know, just take it easy. No, we decided to get in my stepmom's lime green 1986 station wagon, Ford station wagon, you know, POS, and drive it to the hood our, our local hood, you know, in the city and buy crack. And then we continue smoking crack the rest of the night. You know, so I did typical things as a teenager, but I also took it to extremes. Once I graduated high school, I was able to graduate, I can't believe it. I think they just wanted to get rid of me more so than like, you know, try to hold me back. So, you know, I graduated high school, I come out and uh, 
the in drug at that time was uh, pills, you know, opiates, uh, oxys, rocket So I was still doing coke, and then opiates came into play. And that seemed to be my real love. You know, that's, that's the drug that really sunk its grips in me. So I, uh, you know, I'm laying in bed one day, I wake up and I feel terrible. I feel terrible. It's like the worst flu ever, you know. I got, got the cold sweats creeping up my spine. My legs are so restless. I'm floundering in bed, hot and cold sweats. I mean, you just want to jump out of your skin. You feel so terrible. I had no idea what was going on. My buddy comes over and crushes his pillow and he snorted. Instantly, I feel better. I feel like a million bucks. Like a load of bricks has just been lifted off of me. And I'm like, man, what was that? He's like, you were dope sick. You didn't even know. I had no idea going on a run of opiates and then cutting it off will cause you to be dope sick. So I was physically dependent on this drug. It wasn't long before I started doing heroin. Very shortly after that, I started shooting heroin. So at this time, I'm shooting heroin and cocaine on a regular basis. I think I could turn to Ohio and change things. It didn't, it didn't work. You bring yourself with me. I brought the addict with me. So I just continued my drug usage here and uh, things spiraled out of control. You know, and uh, unfortunately, my mom took a lot of the brunt of the, uh, my active addiction. You know, it was stolen TV, stolen money, laptops, you know, anything I can get my hands on to steal, I'd steal from her. But it wasn't until one Sunday morning she wakes up to make her baby boy waffles. Realized I stole her waffle maker. <laughs> She's super pissed, and I gotta go, you know. So I'm out on the streets. I have nowhere to go, no friends. Nothing. I, I, I did a short stint at the shelter once before that, and I knew going to the shelter was not going to work. So I decided to go to an abandoned house, thinking that's my best option, you know. Uh, and you should ask why the abandoned house and not the shelter. Like, it seems pretty insane. But uh, I had peace. No one was asking me for any of my dope, and I was closer to the dope boy. You know, that was my logical thinking at the time. Okay, it's great. I'll, uh, me and the raccoon had an understanding. I fed him honey buns. He didn't fuck with me, you know? So I had a little bag, a little crate, and, you know, I made it my little home, you know? So uh, one day I'm hanging out in the abandoned house, shooting coke, typical Wednesday, whatever it was. It was Easter Sunday, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was Easter Sunday. So yeah, I was shooting coke, typical, you know, Easter Sunday for me. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know, when you're doing coke, you get super paranoid. And uh, you always think the cops are there. So this time the cops actually were there. And I was like, shit. You know, and like I said, I'm a knucklehead. So like, like here I am, officer, take me in. I'm not that guy, you gotta catch me. So the two other people that were my roommates that were living there with me, go down, turn themselves in. Cops are yelling up, dogs barking, I'm up in the attic trying to kick windows out, sweating balls, high as fuck, like, damn, <laughs> you know, because I always had felony warrants, you know, the cops were always looking for me, I knew if they talked to me, I was going to jail, so they had to come and get me, they come up, guns drawn, lay me on the ground, lock me up, throw me in the back of the cop car, at the time, it sucks, you know, <laughs> I'm like, shit, this really sucks, you know, but uh, looking back on it, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, uh, this time they locked me up long enough to, to get me away from the dope long enough to clear my mind. Allow the connection between me and my higher power to open up. At the same time, I was locked up in treatment. And uh, this guy used to come in. And uh, he's, you know, about five, five, hundred and something pounds. Suit slick back hair, super well dressed, classy dude, you know, like just always decked out to the He's right there if anyone call. Wait. That's cool. I just had to embarrass him, you know. So he used to come into treatment, he's in recovery also. Uh, he used to come into the treatment center and bring in house meetings in the recovery center. Guys would always ask him, like, hey, uh, can I get your number? What meetings do you go to outside of here? 
and uh, respectfully he would say, I'll give you my number, I'll tell you what meetings I go to, but more often than not, I'll never see you guys and you'll never call. And uh, so obviously being the asshole I am, every time I seen him in the meeting, I used to say, I'm only here to fight you, because you said I wasn't gonna be here, and you said I wasn't gonna call. So, you know, time goes on and uh, he approaches me one day with this opportunity, man, and uh, he's like, I'm buying an apartment building in Kettering. He's like, I want you to move in and be my maintenance man. And it, it, and it just shocked me, you know, that uh, somebody would offer me this, you know. And he, he says to me, he's like, I see you when you think other people don't see you. He's like, I see your growth. I see what you're doing. I see the change in you. And that truly, I don't know, it does something in your spirit. It changes something in you that it makes you believe you are changing. You're not the same dope fiend loser even conniving piece of shit you used to be. You're starting to be a better human being. So I moved into his apartment. I fixed it up. I didn't pay rent for like eight months. Because <laughs> everything I did was taken off of the rent, which is I'm truly grateful for. You know, uh, I decided to start my own business, and he joined me. So not only is he my best friend, he's my landlord. He's my... Uh, co-owner of the company, and he's my therapist at times. <laughs> he don't co-sign bullshit, trust me. I try it, and, 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 and uh, you know, I'm truly grateful for the opportunity we have. And, uh, you know, now today I'm a father. You know, I, I'm a co-owner of a business. I'm able to hire guys in recovery and help them. You know, I believe God made me a drug addict so I could help pull people out of that, the hell of active addiction. You know, and for all this, I'm truly grateful. Thank you.